More than a thousand ethnic Armenian refugees from the disputed enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh have started arriving in Armenia. They're the first to cross the border since it was captured by Azerbaijani forces earlier this week. The territory is at the heart of one of the world's longest running conflicts. Nagorno-Karabakh lies in the mountainous South Caucasus region of Eastern Europe and Asia between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It's recognized internationally as part of Azerbaijan, but has been controlled by ethnic Armenians for three decades. Olga Ivshina and her team were there and sent this report. As guests of the Azeri military, we enter a region that's been cut off from the outside world since the start of recent hostilities. No sign of civilians, only the relics of fighting. This is Shusha, a key Azeri stronghold since 2020. We are led up to a viewpoint from where we can see Stepanakir. Karabakh Armenians have claimed this city as their capital for the past 30 years. But now it's surrounded by Azeri forces. On show are the seized arms of the other side. We're being shown armored vehicles and ammunition which was surrendered by Karabakh Armenians. It seems that Azerbaijan tries to show that they are the victim in this conflict and their actions are only in response to provocations by Karabakh Armenians, whom they call separatists. Our tour ended there, and we weren't allowed to go any further. But with more than 100,000 people unable to leave Nagorno-Karabakh, this is what we found out. Hi, Olga. Thank you for reaching me. Now even residents of Stepanagir don't have food. So it's, it's really hard for everyone, actually. We are all, all Stepanagir, all country is a big uh, refugee camp now. We, we still don't know even how many missing persons we have killed and injured. Tonight, in the past few hours, hundreds of Karabakh Armenians have made it out and begun arriving in Armenia. Children, the elderly and the sick. Speaking to the BBC, one refugee said the evacuation has begun. There will be more. At the military cemetery in Azerbaijan's capital, they are mourning for more lives lost in this conflict. Their Aliyev family has just buried their son, Valiullah. He was 29 years old. For us, he is still alive. He is our hero. Can we make peace with the Armenians? Yes, of course. But we shouldn't be at war forever. In the end, we have to learn to live peacefully together. I just wish this war hadn't taken so many lives. While new graves are being dug on both sides, will this ceasefire hold? With so many lives lost, peace seems only possible if both sides are ready to learn from each other Spain. Olga Ivshina, BBC News, Nagorno-Karabakh. Well, let's stick with this and cross live now to our correspondent, Kazra Naji. And Kazra, just talk us through where exactly you are and what is happening where you are. Thank you. We are right in the center of Yerevan. This is the capital of Armenia. And behind me, what you see is a row of uh, police, um, riot police, some of them, uh, protecting the main government building uh, to my right, which also uh, houses uh, the office of Prime Minister uh, uh, Nikol Pashinyan. Uh, there have been demonstrations here every day since last week uh, when the Azerbaijanis took over the control of Karabakh. Uh, and these are the demonstrators have been attacking the offices, uh, uh, breaking windows and stuff trying to get inside in protest against what they see as as a feeble response uh, by the government here uh, to what was going on at the time and now um, uh, in Karabakh. Uh, they blame him for doing nothing basically and effectively handing over the control of Karabakh to the Azerbaijanis. They want him uh, to resign. All this is happening at a time when, as you just uh, saw in the previous report, 
thousands and thousands of refugees are heading this way and it's, it's not quite certain whether here Armenia is, is ready uh, to receive so many refugees. There are 120,000 people in, in Karabakh and according to one of their officials, 99.9% of them want to come out and arrive in Armenia. That's 120,000 people that we are not sure uh, this place is ready to receive. Mm. And Kasra, you just mentioned there, you, this, the, the area may not be ready to receive them. Have there been any preparations for this potentially huge influx of people? Well, a few days ago, uh, the Prime Minister said that the government was ready to receive about 40,000 people. But there are no signs of it, and whoever I speak to here, they haven't quite sort of figured out where these people are going to be. Are there going to be camps? Are they going to be housed in hotels or in people's places? Uh, don't forget that uh, the latest figure that we have uh, from 6 o'clock this morning is that by 6 o'clock this morning, some 3,000 people arrived, many of them overnight. Uh, only yesterday, uh, during the day, they were about 500, 600 people. People. Now that overnight it became it went up to about 3,000. So we're expecting in the hours to come, days to come, a huge influx. And uh, there's also another political regional dimension to this. Uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan are pushing for an opening of a corridor between Azerbaijan and, and the western part of Azerbaijan, which is called Nakhchivan, uh, which is bordering with Turkey. And today, the presidents of Turkey and Azerbaijan are visiting Nakhchivan, which is here is seen as a very provocative move because that alludes to the fact that the uh, Azerbaijanis want to cede, uh, want to uh, control even more territory here in this region. Kazra Naji in, uh, as a, in Armenia, thank you for that update and we will be following that story very closely here on BBC News.